In August of 1997, Rare released GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64, and with it came a paradigm shift of what most thought a first-person shooter on a console could be. Based on the 1995 James Bond film of the same name, today GoldenEye is revered for its enemy AI, level design, gameplay, and of course, its legendary multiplayer. GoldenEye may be considered one of the greatest games of the fifth generation of consoles, but on paper, you would think it was destined for failure. GoldenEye went through a lengthy, nearly three-year-long development cycle and was created by a small and inexperienced team. All the people on the team had never made a game before, except for myself and A.D. Smith. The game experienced several delays and came with the stigma that followed games based on a film as licensed TV and movie games had gained a largely well-deserved reputation as quick cash grabs, with little attention or care given to the game's quality. GoldenEye the Game was released two years after GoldenEye the Film had left theaters, long after the movie's buzz had died down. To top it all off, Rare began developing GoldenEye before the Nintendo 64's hardware had even been finalized. This was a recipe for a critical and financial disaster, but instead, Rare delivered a masterpiece, that went on to become one of the best-selling games on the Nintendo 64. From its origins as a 2D platformer for the Super Nintendo, its Nintendo 64 evolution from an on-rail shooter to FPS, and the late edition of its most popular feature, multiplayer. This is the story of GoldenEye on the Nintendo 64. Sometime in late 1994, Nintendo approached Rare about making a game based on their recently acquired James Bond license. Rare had become an important developer for Nintendo and was coming off two very well-received games that would become classics in their own right, Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo and the arcade fighting game Killer Instinct. Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi was a big fan of the James Bond franchise and knew that Rare could be counted on to deliver a high-quality title, particularly since the game was initially envisioned as a 2D platformer for the Super Nintendo, a genre that Rare excelled at. There was just one problem. No one at Rare really seemed to want to work on it. Eventually, news of the James Bond license reached Martin Hollis, who had worked on Killer Instinct as a second programmer and also happened to be a James Bond fan himself. I heard about this as a rumor, and I said to uh, Tim Stamper, this sounds cool, I'd, I'd like to make this game. And he said, okay. And that was, that was pretty much my pitch. <laughs> Proper work on GoldenEye began in January of 1995, with Martin Hollis hiring of programmer Mark Edmonds, who was put in charge of creating an engine that would be capable of drawing skinned characters on the Nintendo 64, not the Super Nintendo. Hollis wanted to ditch the restrictions that came with a 16-bit platformer, feeling that GoldenEye should be a 3D game for Nintendo's upcoming 64-bit system, but 3D didn't mean a free-roaming environment. Instead, Hollis sought to create an on-rail shooter in the vein of Sega's Virtua Cop. In fact, a video of an early version of GoldenEye running as an on-rail shooter was shown during the Nintendo 64's debut at Nintendo's 1995 Space World convention. Martin Hollis and the other team members had been considering a first-person shooter mode of some sort, but the final hardware specs for the Nintendo 64 were still unknown during GoldenEye's early development, so there were concerns regarding what would and wouldn't be possible on the console. According to a 1997 interview with Edge magazine, initially the development team was emulating what they expected the N64 chipset to be like, but they couldn't be sure of its final form. They didn't even know what the controller of the Nintendo 64 would be like and used the Saturn controller during the game's early development. That's right. Sega Saturn controller was used to develop one of the Nintendo 64's best-selling games. But even without a console or proper development kit to work with, the team knew they'd be able to use art and assets creating using workstations from Silicon Graphics, also known as SGI, on the final console. You may recognize SGI as the company that made the computers used to create Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Country's 3D graphics. The decision to take Bond off the rails came about once the team was more confident in what the N64 was capable of. 
The first year of GoldenEye's development was largely used to create the game engine and art assets. Some of that work could be seen in the video shown at Space World 95, which represented about 11 months worth of work. The camera and characters could move around, but missions, AI, and other key components had yet to be created. The first year of development passed, and the GoldenEye team missed their first deadline. Rare was concerned by the lack of progress, but at the same time, also impressed enough by the team's work that they decided not to cancel the project. With Rare's blessing, and the basic groundwork for GoldenEye in place, Hollis and his team set off to create a classic. As the second year of GoldenEye's development began, Martin Hollis hired some much needed additional team members who went to work on creating GoldenEye's levels, missions, enemy AI, and eventually, its unforgettable multiplayer. Early on, the development team had the opportunity to visit the film sets, where they took pictures to use as reference material for models and textures. Many of the film's locations and set pieces made it into GoldenEye's levels with what was, at the time, a great deal of detail and accuracy. The game's similarity to the film was even part of its marketing. You know how to use one of these? GoldenEye. Load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets N64. Being a true James Bond fan, Martin Hollis wanted to fill his game with aspects of the James Bond universe outside of GoldenEye. So he put together a list of about 40 gadgets from other Bond films, which the team would later try to find levels in which they can be used. These and other details like bullet holes in glass, destructible objects, and the Aztec and Egyptian levels, both of which were inspired by other Bond films, helped to give GoldenEye the feeling of being in the universe of James Bond. The GoldenEye film gave the dev team a template for some of their game set pieces, but the inspiration to have multiple missions within a level came from Martin Hollis and fellow team member David Doak's Mario 64 play sessions. GoldenEye's levels and missions were designed in a way that Martin Hollis later described as anti-game design approach. Instead of creating levels objectives first and then designing its layout around them, GoldenEye's team would first create a level and afterwards fill in the objectives and enemies. As Martin Hollis put it, the benefit of this sloppy, unplanned approach was that many of the levels in the game have a realistic and non-linear feel. There are rooms with no direct relevance to the level. This is an anti-game design approach, frankly. It is inefficient because much of the level is unnecessary to the gameplay, but it contributes to a greater sense of freedom and also realism. Part of this anti-game design approach came from the team's lack of experience. Eight of GoldenEye's 10-member development team had never worked on a game before, but ironically, the team's inexperience and even the lack of a real Nintendo 64 during half of the game's development ended up being an advantage. As Graham Norgate put it, because it was most people's first game, we did things that we might not do again because it was too much work. We didn't take the easy route. If something sounded like a good idea, it was like, yeah, let's do it. The world was our oyster. Only afterwards would you find it was a world of pain. This is the Rumble Pack. The big reason why Star Fox 64 is the coolest cinematic gaming experience there is. This approach extended beyond level design. One of the ideas that Rare had come up with was reloading ammo by removing and reinserting the rumble pack. The idea didn't really sit well with Nintendo, so it was ultimately dropped. GoldenEye was also initially a much bloodier game, programmed to have huge spurts of blood explode out of enemies when shot. Even this inexperienced team realized that that would be too much for the conservative Nintendo to approve, so the gore was toned down before showing any gameplay to Nintendo. This turned out to be a smart move, as Nintendo would eventually become so concerned about the level of violence in GoldenEye that they suggested that all of the enemies should get up and shake hands at the end of each level as a way to remind young players that the violence is just pretend. Speaking of those enemies, Martin Hollis had an ambitious plan for GoldenEye's enemy AI. He wanted enemies to be intelligent and act in a manner that was far more realistic than that of most other shooters. All characters will try to survive, but in addition, they might be trying to reach an alarm switch, rescue their comrade, obey an order, play dead, hide under a table, or reach an exit. A system that both used audio and visual cues to alert an enemy of a player's presence was implemented, but an enemy could become aware of your presence without even directly seeing you or hearing your gun fire. If an enemy simply sees another guard get shot, 
they may go and run and trigger an alarm. Your position, actions, and basically whatever the enemy sees and hears all influence how NPCs decide to engage with you, which can range from standing and shooting, strafing, bending down on one knee to fire, and more. This enemy and NPC AI may seem rudimentary by today's standards, but in 1997 it was a refreshing wrinkle in an already novel console FPS game. The character animations you see in GoldenEye were achieved through a motion capture system called A Flock of Birds. By using this system, GoldenEye was able to deliver fairly realistic animations for general movements as well as animations specific to where an enemy was shot. Unlike the refined, free-range mocap suits and systems used in modern games today, the system used for GoldenEye required the motion capture performer to wear a harness that was tethered to a wall and each sensor attached to the performer's body was connected to a wire that ran back into the harness. The motion capture sessions were conducted in the same room used to capture the moves in Killer Instinct. The room was hot, smelly, and the motion capture system was difficult to work with. And you couldn't really do very much in the case of, you know, throwing yourself backwards when you get shot because you would literally yank the entire system off the wall. I had to do forward rolls, not knowing if when I came up I'd be strangling myself on the wires because of that setup. GoldenEye's team members' extra duties weren't limited to motion capture. The development team used their faces for guards and other NPCs in the game, but none more famously than David Doak. David Doak worked on a lot of the mission and level design, as well as much of the level-specific AI scripting, but you probably know him better as Dr. Doak, the double agent scientist in the Archangel Chemicals Weapon Facility. David Doak has a real PhD in biochemistry, so using him as a scientist wasn't much of a stretch. One of the things that can take a great game to the next level is its music, and GoldenEye was no exception. GoldenEye's music and sound effects were created by Graham Norgett and Grant Kirko, two musicians with a resume that includes Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Land 2. The weapons used in GoldenEye are modeled after real guns, though to avoid legal issues their names were changed during development. The Klob, a submachine gun that can be found in several Russian missions, was named in honor of Ken La, a former game designer and executive for Nintendo of America that worked with Rare's dev teams as a liaison of sorts between the two companies. According to Lobb, he was responsible for convincing the team to incorporate unlockable rewards and cheats for completing certain objectives. Ken has also stated that he was lobbying for Nintendo to include four ports on the N64, and wanting to get as many games as possible to support it, he was one of the first to suggest a four-player split-screen multiplayer mode to GoldenEye's team early in its development. Though multiplayer was in Hollis's original design doc, the team had basically shelved the idea due to time constraints as well as the Nintendo 64's somewhat limited resolution. However, in April of 1997, Martin Hollis told programmer Steve Ellis and production designer Duncan Botwood to begin secretly working on developing a multiplayer mode for GoldenEye. There was just one problem. GoldenEye was, for all intents and purposes, already finished and set to be released in a few short months. It's now April of 1997 and GoldenEye is four months from its August release date. The game's single-player campaign, which was its only mode, was finished, and all that remained to be done was some tweaking and game balancing. At this point, GoldenEye had missed its deadline for release by about eight months, and though Rare and Nintendo had been very lenient in terms of giving Hollis' team extra time to work on the game, it was clear that after $2 million and over two years in development, it was time for the game to be released. Steve Ellis um, was the mentioned programmer who uh, did the multiplayer and many other things. He said, one of the things that always strikes me as crazy in retrospect is that until sometime like March or April of 1997, so that's two years after we'd begun, there wasn't a multiplayer mode at all. It hadn't even been started. It really was put in at the last minute, something you wouldn't dream of doing these days and it was done without the knowledge or permission of the management at Rare and Nintendo. The first thing they knew about it was when we showed it to them working. However, since the game was already late by that time, if we hadn't done it that way, it probably would never have happened. There wasn't much time to complete multiplayer, so the team had to make do with the animations that they had already captured. It's the reason why when someone is moving while crouched, their character just slides on the floor. There simply wasn't time to create a walking crouch animation. Three previous Bonds, Connery, Moore, and Dalton were programmed as unlockable characters that could be used in multiplayer, 
Unfortunately, they had to be removed since only Pierce Brosnan had signed over the rights to have his likeness used in the video game. We had all the bonds and you could play deathmatch. Um, MGM came and said, no, Sean Connery will want money. <laughs> um, and probably the rest, when, when, if the rest of them find out Sean Connery's getting money, then they'll all want money as well, and it's just going to cost a lot. So we, we took them out. The data for the other bonds is actually still in the game itself. Rare simply removed the ability to select them. Instead, the team went with other characters the licensing agreement allowed them to use, such as a diminutive odd job. Many consider using odd job as cheating since due to his height, the weapon auto-aim literally goes over his head. GoldenEye's multiplayer includes several modes and scenarios. Some are unique objectives beyond the usual deathmatch, while others are fun cheats that can be implemented in multiplayer such as the Big Head DK mode, paintball mode, and more. In spite of the last minute addition of multiplayer, GoldenEye was still released in August of 1997, but GoldenEye wouldn't be an immediate success. GoldenEye is considered to be one of the greatest Nintendo 64 games of all time, and while that may be subjective, its spot as one of the best-selling N64 games of all time isn't. Depending on your source and regions taken into account, GoldenEye is either the second or third best-selling game in the Nintendo 64 library. But when it was released, GoldenEye only saw modest sales numbers. In a brilliant bit of marketing, Ken Lobb convinced Nintendo of America to give each blockbuster 20 copies of GoldenEye to rent. It wasn't long before word of mouth spread about the quality of GoldenEye. The single player campaign was great, but the GoldenEye gospel being preached on the streets was all about its addictive multiplayer. GoldenEye was often sold out during the 1997 holiday season, but it wasn't because of astronomical sales figures. Nintendo didn't expect a licensed game about a two and a half year old film to sell well, and thus only had a small number of cartridges actually made. Bolstered by retail demand, however, word of mouth, and very strong rental figures, as the months continued, Nintendo increased the number of GoldenEye cartridges it produced. GoldenEye would go on to sell more copies during the 1998 holiday season than it did during the 1997 holidays. Then during the 1999 holiday season, more copies of GoldenEye were sold than in 1997 and 1998 combined. In total, over 8 million copies of GoldenEye were sold by the end of its production run. GoldenEye certainly wasn't the first FPS on consoles or even the first one on the Nintendo 64, but its excellent campaign and innovative multiplayer puts its legacy in a category above most other console shooters of the same era. Martin Hollis believes that GoldenEye grows somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million. Nintendo asked Rare if they'd be interested in making another Bond game based on Tomorrow Never Dies, the follow-up to GoldenEye. Hollis and Rare met with Nintendo, but passed on the opportunity in order to create a game based on their own IP, Perfect Dark. Hollis considered Perfect Dark the spiritual successor to GoldenEye, and though it was a success in its own right, Perfect Dark never reached the financial heights of GoldenEye. In 2008, it was revealed that Rare had been developing an HD remaster of GoldenEye for Xbox Live Arcade. Sadly, Microsoft was unable to reach an agreement with Nintendo to release it. This updated version of GoldenEye would have included several new features, such as equalizing character heights in multiplayer, three new levels, a 60 FPS frame rate, and the ability to instantly switch between N64 style graphics and the updated HD visuals. Outside of that, it's said that it would have been a nearly unchanged port. The footage you're looking at now is from 30 minutes of leaked gameplay footage from the Xbox remaster of GoldenEye that appeared on the internet in 2016. There's actually another GoldenEye 007 game that was developed by Eurocom that was released for the Wii in 2010. This GoldenEye uses the game engine from Dead Space Extraction, is not a port of the N64 classic, and doesn't even star Pierce Brosnan. It was marketed as a reimagining of the GoldenEye film that replaced Brosnan with the then current James Bond actor Daniel Craig. In 2011, a remastered version of Wii's GoldenEye was released for the PS3 and Xbox 360 as GoldenEye 007 Reloaded. These games didn't receive the same critical praise as N64's GoldenEye, but they were fairly well received. GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64 would go on to win seven awards from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, essentially the Oscars of gaming. As of the making of this video, it's been about 23 years since the release of GoldenEye, and the gaming community is still talking about it. Members from the development team are often invited to speak about it at conventions, 
speedrunners continue finding new ways to play GoldenEye, and friendships are still enriched, sometimes destroyed, thanks to its multiplayer. All in all, not bad for a game made by a bunch of rookies. Thanks so much for watching. There's a couple of Philips CDI related Easter eggs in this video, one of which includes a list of my $7 and above Patreon members on the computer screens in the GoldenEye levels. If you want to support the channel monetarily, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. There's a few things about GoldenEye that I ended up cutting out of my final script. One is that a lot of the textures on GoldenEye are in black and white. They simply have the game assign a color to the vertices of those 3D objects with black and white textures and it works out really well. Uh, there's also a ZX Spectrum emulator hidden within GoldenEye. It's not accessible to the player normally, but it can be through patching the game. Uh, my friend Modern Vintage Gamer recently did a really good video about it and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Finally, if you want to keep up with what's going on with the channel, you can follow me on Twitter at WrestlesGaming, but most of all, Thank you for watching.